this is David for Big Bits, and in this video we're going to take a look at gradients one more time with our fill function in Pine on TradingView. And this time, instead of just creating a nice pattern, we're actually going to be giving them meaning or some importance to the gradients so that you can uh, actually look at the chart and tell that the gradients actually uh, are showing you detail or information about the indicator you're working with instead of just looking nice uh, like the repeating gradient pattern in the last video which if, if you haven't seen uh, we'll do a very good job of explaining how we get the gradients on the fills uh, whereas this video we're going to focus on the importance of the uh, the transparency and the colors that you're actually seeing on the chart itself so I have pulled up right now the color gradient framework and I referenced this in the last video as well this is the Pine Coders account that are mod on TradingView. They have several scripts that are very good to reference when you're looking for um, these sorts of things. Uh, the color gradient is really nice. The framework that they did has two different modes and I'm going to be showing you a different mode for the actual gradients. Now the first one they use is an advance and decline. Now that would be this particular fill method and you can see here that uh, when the difference between the two moving averages is increasing, the gradient gets more opaque and less tr less transparent. And you can see when that difference between the two moving averages decreases, it continues to uh, become more transparent. And similarly, we have these gradients on the RSI, I believe that is down here. I forget what they said it was with. Uh, it might be just the histogram on the uh, MACD though. But anyway, the relative mode for the gradients takes into account uh, strength of the values around it before. And so what you're going to see here is that uh, they don't always continue going down in uh, a very very much um, predictable way as you would if you just looked at the chart here and you knew that the moving average were getting closer you could tell you could know exactly how much the gradient is whereas here it's a little bit more relative so it's a little bit more flexible I should say as opposed to the advance and decline. Now I, I should say you can take a look at their code if you are new or an intermediate programmer it it's probably going to be challenging for the new programmers, but if you're intermediate, you'll probably be able to figure it out uh, once you look at it for a little while. But uh, for those of you who are more advanced programmers, it's going to make complete sense if you go through the entire script and you get down to where they're actually plotting things. Now, what I wanted to show you was the gradient pattern that I came up with, which is based on the strength of the difference in the in the fill so what I mean by that is so for example uh, let me move this over here where we've got a better example so for example here you know similar to the uh, advance and decline method that the pine coders account used what I'm looking at here is the strength of the difference so whenever we have a crossover the moving average the difference whatever that is uh, it's always the same as the maximum uh, difference between the two. So as the con number continues to climb at the beginning, the difference between the two is always at its maximum value until finally the difference between the two moving averages becomes less than the maximum dis difference uh, like it was right here. I would say that was the maximum difference at this point in the green cycle. And you can see the difference continue to go down and we are tracking the difference uh, where this is the difference is in reference to the maximum difference on the moving averages now you can see here it continues to widen and it approaches the maximum difference which was back here and you can see it starts to get less transparent and continues to become more transparent here as it narrows and you can see here it sets new maximum differences as it gets very wide on the fill here and it quickly approaches the uh, transparency full transparency as it gets ready to cross over you can see it starts getting brighter and brighter on the red and back to transparent so it's always going to approach transparency 
before the crossover and it's going to be depending on how you have them set up it could be very quickly now let's actually take a look at the code and I've actually kind of set up our code here to where we're using a bit more of the coding styling guide that they have on the Pine Coders website. And we're going to try and stick to that going forward uh, just to make sure that uh, you know we're following their standards so that if somebody in the community is also following their standards, we're also going along with it. So when people look at our code, they can also read it as well. So it's going to take a little bit to get used to, and I'm going to have a video coming up soon about that. So just look out for that. But for the most part, if you followed along through the whole tutorial series at this point, you should know what we're doing. It's just basically changing where we are doing certain things in the script and how they are being named, essentially, how we're declaring the variables. That's about it. Okay, so we've added a couple of inputs since the last video. These are just for our moving average length, and I haven't bothered to give them a title or anything. Uh, we've also uh, added our citation in here, which is where we have copied the code over from the gradient framework from Pine Coders, and we made a small change since we are working with percentages. Instead of just using uh, numbers 10 through 1, we are actually going to be using numbers uh, 1 through 100 or 0 through 100 because we're working with percentages. Now, uh, we also had to come up with a function to determine where we are relative to the maximum amount. So in our fills, our maximum amount, let's say, let's look at this one. This stands out a little bit better. Our maximum width is right here. We're fully opaque. Now, when we're here, our current distance between the two, let's say, is 5, just for an example, and our maximum distance is 10 back here. We're getting the percentage difference uh, like relative to where we were to the maximum. So if our distance here was 5 and our distance here was 10, our difference would be 5, which is 50% of 10. So what we're going to be doing there is we're actually going to be returning uh, this number because the G value is greater than 40, but it is not greater than 50. So it's going to return this value, which is pretty much in the middle of our alpha gradient that we're using based on that function. Now, if that was confusing at all, please go back and watch the previous video where I explained that a little bit more as to what all of these numbers mean here. Now, we do have to declare several variables as well. We have to keep track of the maximum difference since uh, our crossover. So whenever there's a crossover, we start keeping track of a new maximum difference. And then we also have to keep track of our current difference. Uh, we don't actually have to keep track of it to reference it in the past, but we do have to uh, instantiate that variable so we can use it later. And then also we have to have a variable to calculate and store our current percentage difference. That would be the 50% value here. Now, the logic on this is very simple, and that is just that we are going to check for a crossover. If there is a crossover, we're actually just going to reset our maximum difference since equal to the current difference. And we I skipped over this, my apologies, but the current difference is always the absolute value of the MA1 minus MA2. So you're always going to get a positive value there because we're measuring a distance or a length, and those are always positive values. Now, of course, when I say we have the crossover, we're setting our maximum difference equal to our current difference because this is the first difference we've had in this new series with the crossover. And the same goes with the cross under as well. And unlike the previous video, we don't have to keep track of the direction we're going. We can know that just by knowing that we haven't had a new crossover and we are still under or still below and we do that in our plot down here but otherwise if this isn't a crossover and this isn't a cross under the only thing left to do is check to see if we have a new maximum uh, so while these numbers are getting farther and farther apart we continue to update the maximum difference say it was six back here seven eight nine ten it continues to update so our maximum difference here was still ten because it didn't increase anymore, but our current distance was 5, uh, so that's how we got our 50% difference we talked about earlier. Now, 
that is really about all there is because then we called that function uh, that I mentioned for the percentage of which returns uh, based on our current value and our maximum value relative percentage to where it is uh, on the maximum amount. So on that 5 and 10 example it was 50%. That function is going to set our current percentage difference equal to 50 in that instance and then all we have to do is plot. So this is actually very simple to do. Uh, the logic is very easy to read in my opinion especially compared to all of the functions in the gradient framework and that's very good work and it's very advanced and it looks a lot better than what I have here. Let's be honest, this is mostly just green all the way and a couple of bars that aren't, uh, aren't so green. But uh, if you're wanting to capture strength relative to the maximum value, this is a very easy way to do that. Now, of course we have our plots and then the last thing we do of course is our fill function which is last four videos here have been about now and this is going to be the last one on fills for a while hopefully because I think everyone has had their fill of fill right <laughs> that was a horrible pun okay uh, so we have our fill we're plotting one two and of course we know the color based on whether or not MA1 is above 2, and then we return green if it is and red if it isn't. We pass in the percentages now. Since we changed these values to have uh, a 0 in the singles digit and move the 6 or the 1's digit over to the left, we now can reference those versus the percentage values. So really that's all there is to this particular video. And I do want to go back to the pine coders example because it does look much better than what I have here. And I'll probably end up publishing this particular script so you can see it and you don't have to copy it by watching the video. So keep a look out for that on my profile. You can always check that out. It's in the description of the video below. So if you haven't checked it out, please follow me there. That'll help you out to keep up to date with what I've posted. Uh, the color gradient framework, let's go back to that and check that one more time. You can see, I think it's a little bit nicer because our value stayed much more opaque for much longer here in our moving average differences. So I believe this looks a little bit better, although it would still kind of be nice to have it uh, somewhat opaque because it kind of completely disappears here so there are drawbacks and uh, benefits to both methods I would say but it's all very nice it makes your chart look a lot nicer and one other thing that I wanted to mention before the video is over is that you should consider thinking outside of the box here uh, these gradients we are working with what we see. We see a moving average and another moving average, but what you could do is actually use another indicator to give you your gradient values. So for example, let's take the relative gradient. Uh, you could use this relative gradient from the MACD or the RSI, whatever they chose to use, and you can actually put that gradient between the moving averages. So you kind of combine the two into one particular indicator. Now, if you all want to see that, I can do that, but really all there is is doing exactly what we did, but instead of plotting the difference for the moving averages, you just plot the differences for the other indicator, the MACD or the RSI. So I hope that helped. Uh, if you like this video, please leave a like and check out the profile, of course. And while you're down there, hopefully you're giving it a like. If you haven't already, please subscribe. Because if you like this video, there are plenty of other videos very similar to this where we cover tutorials for TradingView and PineScript. And we also talk about some other things on the channel, such as uh, crypto and crypto-related projects, because that's something that I like. Now, you can also please check out, if you're considering a paid plan on TradingView, please consider using the referral link in the description of the video. That will help you get $30 and myself $30 towards an upgraded plan. And that is really nice to have, in my opinion. So if you're considering that, please look at that. But other than that, I think that is it for this video. We'll have another one soon. Uh, like I mentioned, we'll talk about the styling guide or the coding uh, style guide in another video soon. I'm hoping to have a few other things out 
in the meantime and it may be a week or so before we get another tutorial video out we'll see how that goes but for the most part things are moving very well and I appreciate every one of you who are watching all the new videos and have kept up with everything so far I really appreciate that but other than that thanks and have a great day Thank you.